Good evening, my lovelies. I'm Lady McCreepster, and you're listening to Mortis Media. If you enjoy tales of horror, ghosts and ghouls, creepypasta and mayhem, pop over to my channel at the end of this video. A direct link to my channel is in this video description below and also at the end of this video. I do hope you come over and visit. For now though, let's begin today's video here on Mortis Media. Today's tales are all true accounts of airline horrors. I hope they don't put you off flying for too long. So come now, my dears. Lean in closer, and we'll begin. I work night shifts at an airport, cleaning planes for different airlines. I recently got the pass to start cleaning for a second airline. I never had any issues until I started working on these two planes. I clean the same group of planes every night, as they stay at my airport overnight. Well, while working on one of these two planes for Airline 2, I noticed someone walk down the aisle behind me. I thought it was my co-workers leaving me to clean the plane alone, but when I looked around, my co-workers were on the opposite end of the plane still working. This happens every night I work, pretty much. I see people walk behind me, or hear footsteps, and when I look around, there's no one there. Not really a big deal, but it's all I got. Seeing as I don't believe in ghosts, but it's something that's been bothering me. So next time you're on a plane, be careful. It might be haunted. I was flying from Tokyo to Jeju, South Korea to meet my husband for a vacation. Had an 11-hour layover at the International Airport in Busan. What they don't tell you is the whole airport closes at 11pm because it is adjacent to apartments and the airport is too loud. And they make everyone leave. Everyone. I was under the impression I could just hang out in the airport or sleep until my flight in the morning. Oh, hell no. At 10.30, I'm approached by a rude guard who stated in very broken English, You leave now. All people leave. I had lived in Seoul, South Korea several years ago, but I had never been to Busan and I was surprised at the guard's rudeness. Most people I meet in Korea are awesome. So here I am on the sidewalk with my bags in the middle of the night and the place is dead. When I say dead, I mean no employees, no janitors, even no taxis. So even if I wanted to get a hotel now, I can't. Two very creepy taxi drivers tell me through Google Translate, they will take me anywhere I want to go. No, it's almost 1am now and there's no way I'm getting into a car with you, creepy. Finally, a younger and nicer security guard explains to me that he has a place I can sit until my flight. It's the bus stop's main terminal. I go into the terminal and several other foreign flyers are in there as well. Glad I'm not the only one, about eight other people. Glad to have somewhere to hang out, but there is no bathroom and only a drink machine. Glad I brought snacks. Also, did I mention this is summer and there are huge fucking mosquitoes all over the place? So here I am, tired as fuck, slightly allergic to mosquitoes, having to haul my ass and go hide behind parked cars every time I have to pee. My previous time in Asia makes me carry toilet paper wherever I travel. Thank baby Jesus. I finally decide to pop open my smaller suitcase and sleep in it after playing on my phone and reading for what felt like a hot, moist, eternal hell. Wake up five hours later, covered in red welts, saw and the bus terminal is a fucking ghost town. I had set an alarm, but on international trips, I usually have great luck with meeting other travellers who will help you out in a pinch or treat you kindly. Not these fuckers. Again, ghost town. I load up, walk back to the airport, buy breakfast, 
later on check in and wait to board. But there's more. My night slash day from hell continues. The flight company from Busan to Jeju is really small and cheap. My mistake, I know. They can't get their shit straight. They line us up to board, and after an hour, everyone realizes the damn plane is going to the wrong gate. Oh wait, that's not the wrong plane. They have us all lined up at the wrong gate. Everyone line up again. Everyone runs, and Jesus, every fucking Korean woman over the age of 40 will tackle your ass to be in front. It's also raining. And even though the flight agents are bilingual, they will only make announcements in Korea, at an international airport, with plenty of foreigners. So I have no idea about the flight changes, etc. Damn plane finally comes two hours late, and no gate for it to land at. So they end up bussing us to the plane. Just for reference, a flight from Tokyo to Jeju usually takes three hours. It's been a year and I'm still damn salty. So I have this story. A lady brought her service animal on board. Turns out it was just a pet she had brought a vest for. This dog was completely out of control. He was jumping all over us in the row, barking, growling, snapping at people, and running all over the place. The flight attendant told her she would need to keep the dog in the carrier, and the lady turned into a witch, saying that she had no right to tell her to put her service dog away. Mid-flight, the dog took a dump right on the aisle floor, and it reeked so bad. Her dog had crawled up in my face, and its long nails scratched me through my shirt so hard that I began bleeding. After I got off the plane, I met up with my family and they said, Oh my god, you smell like a wet dog. And I had to tell them this story of this awful lady and her service dog. My god, my trip to Israel. I went on birthright a couple of summers ago. I flew with El Al. For those who have never travelled to Israel, they question you very intensely before you can even check your bags. They basically interrogate you and ask you all sorts of questions. Who are you travelling with? Who packed your bags? What was your childhood like? How Jewish are you? Etc, etc. Apparently, they didn't like some of my answers, so they forced me to check my very carefully packed carry-on and empty all of my belongings into a plastic grocery bag. The straps on the bag broke within five minutes of receiving it, so I had to awkwardly cradle it like a baby as I went through security. As if that wasn't bad enough, on the plane I was seated away from my group in a middle seat between two rude Israeli strangers. The guy sitting in the aisle became visibly irritated every time I needed him to move so I could use the restroom. The seat was horribly uncomfortable, I had no legroom and there was a child behind me kicking my seat for hours on end. I took a sleeping pill but couldn't fall asleep, so I just sat there, horribly uncomfortable and drugged out from the sleeping pill for 14 hours. It was torture. By the time morning came, I was absolutely miserable and felt like complete shit. I was so relieved when the flight attendant came around with breakfast and coffee. I asked for some coffee, but I was so drowsy and out of it that I didn't realize I had to give him the mug that was sitting on my tray so he could pour me some. He stood there, staring at me, before asking in the most condescending voice, Are you going to give me your mug? He and the two strangers then laughed at me and shared a joke in Hebrew at my expense. By this point, I was practically in tears. We finally landed about two hours later. Worst fucking flight of my life. Zero out of ten. Would not fly with El Al again. I was flying home from Aruba on a family vacation as a kid. It was a fairly smooth flight on a 747. All of a sudden, we heard the engine spin up big time and the plane dives like super steep dives, and you can hear and feel the acceleration. Naturally, people are screaming and freaking the hell out, 
and after no more of 10 to 20 seconds, but that actually felt endless, we level off and the engines decelerate. Then the pilot comes up on the intercom, with something along the lines of, Sorry about that folks, there was an inbound other country 747 on the same altitude as us, and we couldn't get communication confirmation, so we had to execute an emergency dive to prevent a collision. Fun times. Before I begin, I have no prejudice or issues with anyone of Middle Eastern descent. Anything I say is honestly just to describe the people around me and the situation as it happened. My mother and stepfather live in Europe and I visited them for Christmas break. I was an undergrad in a large NYC school so I was flying Frankfurt to JFK. Because I am highly intelligent, I read my flight time as 11.50 when it was actually 11.05. Cue me dashing through the airport and barely making it on the last bus to the tarmac which was reserved for people who had to go through a secondary hand search of belongings security check. As I had just barreled my way through a large international airport, I was one of those lucky few. The rest, all Middle Eastern from families with kids, an elderly woman and mostly single men. Great job, not obviously racially profiling. Anywho, I had just barely made it. The bus had closed its doors and was ready to leave until I came flying out with an out-of-breath German airport agent trailing behind me. Covered in sweat, embarrassed, but thankful I made it as the semester started the next day. I observe my fellow security risks. Sarcasm, but that's actually what we technically were. I notice a middle-aged man in what I would say is traditional Middle Eastern clothing. He was in a white sort of robe that went down to his ankles and his sleeves to his wrists. He had headgear on. It was a cap with an embroidered design that circled fully around his head and barely extended past the top of his skull. I don't know the name. I apologize. I only noticed him and subsequently his clothing because he was on the phone and he was sobbing. Not the quiet sniffle cry I did when I realised I had messed up the time, but full-on hiccuping cries while he talked on the phone. I felt bad. He was speaking in Arabic, so I didn't know what was going on, but I could imagine it maybe was along the lines of him being upset he might miss his flight as our bus was not guaranteed to get to the plane in time. We get on the plane, make our way to our seats, and I'm delighted to find that I'm in the aisle, no one in the middle, and a decently good-looking girl in the window seat. Yeah, buddy. The crying man was behind me as we shuffled down the aisles. I noticed he had no carry-on luggage, but didn't really care. Once I sat down, he kept going, looked around a bit confused, then sat down in the middle of about five unoccupied middle rows. It was a 333 layout. Having myself been shuttled back and forth across the Atlantic many a time, I know that was where the flight attendant would set up their sleep area for rest in between shifts. I was about to tell him that, but a FA swooped in and directed him to the seat on his ticket, which was in the middle of the road directly behind me. He was still crying, but I cry a lot too, so I think little of it. Thankful I was safely on the plane and headed back to school in the good old US of A, I settled in and tuned out the welcome video that started playing. Well, that didn't last long. The video paused as the flight attendant made the customary, Hello, I'm flight attendant Brunhilde, your pilot as Volks with First Officer Wagen. This flight is from Frankfurt to NYC. If this is not your destination, what the fuck are you doing here? Get the fuck off. Taxiing begins and I'm on my way back to studiously playing soccer and getting led. There's a commotion behind me and the man from before stands up, starts crying harder, sobs and hiccups aplenty and once the flight attendant's speech is done, he yells, This is a lie! This plane is not going to New York! Well, that's news to me. Are we going to Hawaii, perhaps? The dude is screaming, sobbing in a mixture of English and Arabic. And I'm just waiting for us to get up in the air, 
so that the drink service can begin so I can get my, you know, drink on. He graciously, really, for being in such an upset state, slid past the woman in the aisle and started screaming and gestulating at the various flight attendants stationed around. He utters what every owner of a lily white butt has been conditioned to fear. Allah. Specifically, New York is a lie, they're lying to us. Allah will deliver us to paradise. There were more pronouncements, but as they were a mix of English and Arabic, I don't quite remember. Essentially, they were the last fucking thing you'd want to hear on a large aluminium thing, whether you're 30,000 feet in the air or sitting on the tarmac. Now, NYC sucks big time, at least for an introvert like myself who didn't want to go to school there in the first place. And even then, I was getting concerned. Judging by the faces of my fellow lily white butt owners, they were terrified. His shouting was then solely in Arabic. My exhausted and stressed out brain could only think, if I just fucking sprinted to get on this plane and some shit happens and I die, I am going to be outraged. Also, I would be dead, but I would still be outraged. Our plane screeches to a halt. Well, it slowly rumbles into plane park and die Polizei, God, I fucking love German, really gets the phlegm out of my throat surround our plane and unceremoniously charge down the aisles, body armor and guns all over. Excuse me, I'm with the TSA and you can't do that. And take him off the plane, presumably into custody. Due to our proximity with him, the passengers in the rows in front and behind him were questioned by the police. Me, being a member of the bus of public enemies number to be determined, got grilled even harder. I told them I'm stupid American, and I got my times mixed up, admitted to my sin, got baptized, and was released. We all told them that as far as we knew, he had no carry-on luggage, and the agents in the airport said he hadn't checked any baggage. But still, they investigated all checked luggage, fingers crossed, they didn't see my sex toys. Know what I'm saying? The guy continued screaming various iterations of this plane isn't going to New York as he was hauled off in cuffs, which doesn't quite make for a relaxing 10-hour trip. The flight was uneventful afterwards, but there was obvious tension in the air. Ha, see what I did there? Cause like, the plane was in the air? I have always hated flying and this certainly didn't help. But the man in the row behind me, let's not meet again. I was flying from Vegas to Stockton. Mistake number one, Stockton. And right at takeoff, the plane started shaking violently. I admit this can be normal, but the pilot somehow turned on the intercom and was shouting, whoa, whoa, like he was terrified, which in turn made me terrified. I literally started to cry. I thought this was the end. For the first time in my life, I had never until that moment actually felt like I could perish. They turned off the intercom pretty quickly, and after the longest minute of my life, the plane stopped shaking, and I silently wept for the rest of the 30-minute flight. They never addressed what happened. They never reassured anyone. They just pretended like it didn't happen. Now, I am no novice to air travel. I have flown all over the world, and have even felt a little jittery about flying in the past. But I can honestly say that I don't know if I can ever be so casual about flying again. Pilot here. I used to fly for a small outfit based in Anchorage, Alaska, flying mail around the state and the occasional passenger charter. On this particular day, I was tasked with relocating 19 cannery workers from Dillingham to Petersburg with a fuel stop in Anchorage. Upon arriving in Dillingham, I realized that my passengers all ranged from 18 to 25. They were pretty amped and a couple appeared to be a bit intoxicated. I let them on board. That was a mistake. My plane was too small for a flight attendant, so it's just me and my first officer watching these guys throughout the flight. 
I knew things were going to get interesting from the start because these kids kept jumping out of their seats, raising hell during taxi. It's about an 80 minute flight to Anchorage, and once we leveled off, those cannery workers were completely out of control. Kids were running up and down the aisle, others were trying to sneak alcohol to each other. And this one chick near the back was, I shit you not, giving dudes blowjobs from across the aisle. At this point, my FO and I are trying to keep our passengers seated while also flying the plane, and things finally boiled over while on approach. We were maybe 2,000 feet from landing. I looked back one last time to make sure everyone was seated. As I glanced down the aisle, this dude who looked pretty fucked up began puking. Like fire hose style. It got all over his buddy's shoes and his buddy got up and started punching him in the face. Now chaos erupts and everyone is out of their seats pulling this guy off his puking friend. Bath and blood everywhere. We land and the airport police come to the airplane. People start deplaning and it's apparent that every single passenger is now drunk. They were all sneaking drinks during the flight. The guy who punched his friend gets arrested, and I've got 18 drunk passengers left. Their employer wants them to continue to Petersburg, and I'm like, hell no! So I decided to make a deal. If each of them can blow under 0.08 alcohol content, they can get back on board. Otherwise, they're walking. Not one kid could show me they were sober, and the flight was cancelled. That was the worst airplane experience I've ever had. For context, I'm terrified of planes. In sixth grade, my school invited me and some friends for a trip to another state. The thing is, we had to go by plane. The trip was great, but the day we were supposed to return, there was a giant storm going on. The plane took off, regardless. And let me tell you, kid me almost had a stroke. Not only was it shaking a lot, people weren't calm. Everyone was basically going insane and ready to give up on life. To make matters worse, for some unknown reason, we had to go back. I thought it's because we were going to perish in the storm. We returned to the airport and I phoned my family and started crying so much that I basically wanted someone to go over to that state by car to pick me up, and it's a five day ride. Later we found out that a piece of ice hit the pilot's window, cracking it, making us return to the airport. I was terrified, and that left a scar on my mind. Now, whenever I enter a plane, I remind myself of what happened. Thankfully, on the day after, and not being able to sleep in the hotel because I was too scared, the two flights we had to take went fine, and I returned home safely. Probably not as bad as some of the others I've seen on this post, but this actually happened on my most recent flight. I was flying from Sydney, Australia to Auckland, New Zealand. Get on the flight with my best friend. We settle down, cool, no issues. We are on the tarmac for at least an hour, but I've flown enough times to know that the pilots can't do anything about that. Heck, I would like to be a commercial pilot myself one day. Shit happens. The plane finally takes off, and a young child, maybe five or six years old, begins making a fuss. I'm fairly tolerant of young kids, but this is a whole different level. His mother ignores it, while the other son, maybe a year or two older, is visibly upset, but staying quiet. I offer him a sympathetic look. I put in my headphones, fine, I can still hear them, but it's tolerable until I notice the smell. Oh gosh, the smell. The mother sitting behind me has the audacity to remove her shoes and socks and place her feet up on my armrest. 
I look at my friend in horror and then try to capture the attention of the flight attendants, but nothing. She kept wriggling her toes too. Minor detail to add, but a very uncomfortable experience. She had her feet on both armrests too, so I couldn't lean away. This is about a three-hour flight. Thank God it wasn't any longer. I just about vomited multiple times. Usually a wonderful airline, but I'm still unsure as to why the flight attendants didn't react to this obviously uncomfortable situation. Maybe I should have verbally said something. I had a pretty bad experience while flying. It was New Zealand to Frankfurt, Germany. Non-stop. It was a really long flight. I sat in the three-seat window section with a couple. The woman gets airsick the moment she steps on the plane, so she started using the sick bags before we even shut the doors. And she did not stop. For over 20 hours. I got used to smelling her bile after a while, but couldn't get used to the sound of her retching. I broke out the bottle of Jack Daniels I bought in duty free, and drank until I passed out. Of course, 23 hours allows for time to sleep off a bottle of Jack and wake up hungover. And when I did wake, I look over towards the window and there was that woman with the bag still at her face. Not long ago, I flew to Chicago to see my girlfriend. I'd done this once before and the flight there and back was great. This time, the flight there was fine, but on the way back, I noticed that the pilot was being weird as we got close to my home airport. We were notified that we would be landing soon, but an hour later, we were still very high in the air. I looked out the window and noticed we were going under the clouds, then quickly going back up. Then we'd go back down again and back up. I don't mean a few feet either. I went from seeing the tops of clouds to seeing individual cars on the freeway to the tops of clouds again. We still weren't landing. The plane began to shake. A lot. Looked outside and we were turning. 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 Still turning. Now, turning the other way. Sink. Rise. Sink. Rise. By this point, I was having a really bad panic attack, but tried hard not to make a scene. I could hardly breathe. It felt as though the pilot had no idea what he was doing. When we finally landed, I started crying. It took another half an hour for the pilot to be directed to a bay so we could get off that death trap. That was only the fourth time I've ever been in the air by myself. I was riding on a plane home, and the woman in front of me started snoring loudly. As it was a night flight and me being a light sleeper, this was pretty annoying. But I just sat there with my headphones in, trying to fall asleep to this podcast I was listening to. When all of a sudden, my ears perk up in a moment of silence. The woman is muttering. I pause my podcast and listen to see what she's babbling about. And it goes something like this. We had to do it, Derek. We had to. They couldn't live. We needed to throw them in the lake. They wouldn't have survived the winter anyway. I know he was my son but he needed to go. Babbling on over and over about her son and the cold and the winter and the lake. I got a fairly good idea by the end of this that this woman had done something horrific in her past and couldn't deal with it and it was just blubbering out because it was in her subconscious. It freaked me out a little bit and I made note to not annoy that woman at any cost. was going back to California from Hawaii on a plane trip with my family. It was a six-hour flight and they had TVs for each seat and a selection of movies you could pick to watch. The ride to Hawaii, a morning flight, was great, 
But on the ride back, which was an afternoon flight about a week later, we started getting into some heavy turbulence about three hours in. Now, I'm scared stiff of turbulence, even when there's just a little bit of it. But this turbulence was really heavy, and it kept sending the plane up and down in lurching drops. So I was inwardly freaking out and practically catatonic. The pilot said they'd try to get out of the turbulence, and it might take about half an hour. Now, how long we were in that turbulence? Three full hours. Watching Big over and over again was the only thing that kept me somewhat sane, and the fact that my dad was in the seat next to me. When we landed, my family said they were surprised that I was so calm. I freaked out on turbulence before, and I explained to them that I was catatonic essentially during that time. Haven't been on a plane since. While in the military, my unit had an exercise. We had to fly a few hours away. Apparently, my unit rented a big plane, and had some Air Force pilots fly it. My assumption is those pilots never flew those big planes, so they wanted to see what it could do. When we took off, it felt like a space rocket as we went straight up. They then turned the plane like they were dodging missiles. Finally, we were on course to our destination. So I thought everything would go smoothly from that point. Nope, I fell asleep and woke up feeling like I was in freefall. I was terrified. I looked across the aisle and saw one of my officers looking back at me with that "Oh my God, this is the end" kind of look on his face. Everyone else was still asleep. I guess these pilots decided they wanted to see how many engines they could turn off. Because I began noticing the sound of engines powering on and off. Life lesson: Do not allow an Air Force fighter pilot to pilot a large civilian plane. It will not be a comfortable flight. We've all had in-air experiences with crying babies, armrest hogs, strange odors, and broken amenities. But those are pretty much par for the course when you fly. Hell, I'm not sure I'd feel like I got my money's worth if I didn't disembark with a stiff neck and a troubling numbness in my legs. Still, my worst in-flight experience didn't come as a result of any such expected inconvenience, but rather at the hands of someone trying to be nice. I was about eight years old, and although I can't recall what destination my family had chosen, I doubt if I'll ever forget the time that I spent on that flight. Due to some issue or another with our tickets, the four of us. Myself, my younger brother, my mother, and my father had been seated in seemingly random spots throughout the plane, and none of us were next to each other. This would have been fine if it hadn't been for the fact that my neighbor was an incredibly attractive young woman who seemed to be entirely oblivious to every rule that governed polite society, or at least every rule as they were understood by an eight-year-old. Within moments of my having sat down next to the girl, she'd done her best to engage me in conversation. I knew that I wasn't supposed to speak to strangers, and thus her friendly small talk made me very uncomfortable. Not as you might think, because I was at all wary of dialogue with her, but because I knew that my parents might walk by and catch me. The young woman's next transgression was taking out and turning on her Walkman while the plane was in the process of taking off. For those of you who may not recall, a Walkman is like an iPod, except that it could only hold about two dozen songs, and it had a tendency to transform them into spaghetti. I can remember scrambling to grab the safety pamphlet from the seat in front of me, then frantically pointing at the section that warned about electronic devices being inactive during takeoff. The girl just smiled reassuringly and kept right on with her forbidden activity, causing me to grip my armrest in terror. If that had been the end of things, I might have escaped without the psychological scarring that I still carry. But unfortunately, my adversary was far from finished. 
About midway through the flight, she dug through her purse and pulled out a small package of something, which she opened with a nonchalant smile. Max, she said to me, would you like a cherry cough drop? Alarm bells rang in my head like they never had before. My mother had always told me that any stranger who offered me medicine was gearing up to do some very nasty things to me. She had never specified what those nasty things were, but I knew that they had to be truly abhorrent. Maybe though, just maybe, the girl didn't realise that cough drops were medicine and was simply one of those people who ate them for their flavour. I'd heard legends of folks like that, and if it happened that my seatmate was one of them, maybe this was an opportunity for education. No, oh no thank you, I replied. I'm not sick or anything. Okay, the girl said brightly. Are you sick? I asked, hoping to prod the conversation forward. In the face of this new potential threat, I'd all but forgotten about not talking to strangers. The young woman shook her head. Nope. I felt the panic in my chest start to subside. Then why are you eating cough drops? They're medicine, you know. Oh, I know, the girl said with a laugh. But they taste wonderful and they help me relax. The klaxons in my head started blaring with a new vigour. Not only was this stranger talking to me, but she was also one of those people who ate medicine for fun. And she was trying to offer me some. I'd been warned about all three of those things, but never in my life had I expected to meet such a threatening trifecta of terror. I spent the rest of the flight in complete silence all the while ready to scream if the petite 17-year-old next to me showed any signs of attempting a kidnapping. I am a woman from California. I am not a traveller. I can't drive more than a few hours before my legs cramp up. And the train? I'm terrified. Flying-wise, I've been on a plane a few times to Ohio. And the last time we flew back home, they cancelled the flight, and it was during Hurricane Fran when my son was seven. Fast forward to several years, and my son is in boot camp in Kentucky. We are invited to share his graduation from boot camp, and did I mention it's in Kentucky? My husband and I decided to fly back for our only child's graduation from boot camp and I was really looking forward to seeing all the things he had been doing, so he booked a flight. The flight was beautiful. I was still nervous, but seeing my son graduate was worth a few butterflies in my stomach. He took us through Fort Knox, the army base, not the gold storage building, and we got to see where he had his various exercises. We had a wonderful visit. Although, because I am a native Californian, Kentucky was quite a culture shock. We toured Killian and saw some interesting things around the state. My favourite part was going into Subway, the sandwich place, and asking for avocado on my sandwich, and then giving me a very confused look and asking, what's avocado? The graduation was beautiful and all of the young soldiers looked so handsome. We flew home, which was very nice, and I was beginning to think that I could be a flyer. My son was sent to Fort Hood for his AIT training. That's training for his specific job. He was a tanker, and he loved Fort Hood. They had a graduation that my husband and I flew back for, and the flight went off without a hitch. We toured a small part of Texas around the base and saw some interesting sights. At least they knew what an avocado was. And when my son's time for our visit was up, we had to fly back home. I was actually looking forward to the flight home, and I was just slightly apprehensive. We said our goodbyes, and we were on our way to the airport. We boarded a nice big jet and our flight took us from Fort Hood in Texas, right past Ontario, where we needed to go, and straight 
to LAX, smack dab in the middle of Los Angeles, which is one city I have an extreme fear of. Our flight from Texas to LAX was uneventful and nice. Wow, I'm a flyer. I can travel and go anywhere. This is very exciting for me because I haven't been able to do much because of my fears. And now it changes. Or does it? LAX was the usual chaotic place, but we arrived on time and without incident. We went to check in for our next flight to Ontario, which we could drive to. Our flight to ONT was changed several times for reasons I can't remember. We finally get a flight and proceeded to the gate to wait. They finally called for boarding, and I was expecting the usual first class passengers can board now, then rows 1 through 10, etc. They just called for all passengers can board now instead, and there was something my husband was not telling me as we began towards the doors that led to the plane. And as I was walking to said door, I looked onto the tarmac and didn't see the elevated platform that they used to walk us to the big jets. We were going straight onto the tarmac. I stopped at the door to outside, and my legs decided that they did not want to walk any longer, and I grabbed the door frame in order not to fall. I looked like a stubborn child holding onto this door frame, so as not to go to the bathroom to take a bath. Now picture an overweight, exhausted woman doing the same thing, but at an airport. The people inside looked like dominoes were running into each other. So my husband just pushed. As my husband pushes me out onto the tarmac, and all the way up the stairs leading to this little propeller plane that maybe held 10 to 20 people. As I'm pushed all the way up the stairs, every step feels like I'm walking through water. We get to the top, and I'm being led to my seat by a flight attendant. I can't move. The flight attendant looks at me and says, Come on, as my husband pushes me, and I decide to sit in the first seat I see, which is right next to a gentleman that I can't remember. He graciously gives up his seat to my speechless husband, so that he can sit next to me, which turns out was fortunate for him that he moved. I can't breathe, I can't talk, I can't even swallow any water from the water bottle that my husband magically pulls out of his backpack before putting the backpack somewhere I can't remember. As we take off, the flight attendant buckles into a seat facing the passengers and looks calm, so I don't worry. When we boarded the plane, I noticed it was slightly windy, which I wasn't worried about. As we take off, I lose it. As it's so windy, we have to fly out in the opposite direction of the wind, which is towards the ocean. My biggest fear is flying over water. As soon as the plane turns around over the water, it's just over there long enough for me to lose control. As we ascend, I notice a slight bouncing feeling, and it gets much worse. We hit cruising altitude, and it feels like a ping pong ball in a dryer. As I'm holding my water bottle, still unable to drink any, we bounce all over the sky. My husband keeps telling me to calm down, and that it's a smooth flight and that we're almost there. The flight attendant never even left her seat, and kept her eyes on me as we fly. I tried to hold my breath, but that only lasts so long. I look out the window and I'm shaking so badly that my husband closes the window screen. I was sure the plane was going to crash, and I picture the news coverage. A passenger plane was brought down due to the Santa Ana winds, news at 11. We are landing, and I can't breathe, and I'm sure it's the end. Why couldn't I perish before we got on the plane? We land in Ontario, and that was that. I was ruined. As my feet hit the tarmac, I told my husband that I would never fly again, and that if he tried to get me on a plane, I'd wring his neck. My son is no longer in the army, and is graduating from college this weekend, and thankfully it's local. My husband decided that next year we might take a cruise. It leaves from Washington, so I'd better start walking now. 
The scary part is that it's a seven day cruise to Alaska. I get severely seasick, and we're gonna be on a boat in the middle of the ocean for seven days. I get sick on the Balboa Ferry, which is a 300 foot journey. Sometimes I think my husband doesn't want me around anymore. In August, my boyfriend and I and his brother and wife spent a week in Punta Cana. It was awesome. It was actually fucking awesome. Unfortunately, Hurricane Isaac was scheduled to hit the island at essentially the same day and time we were supposed to be leaving, and this caused us some stress. Normally, we wouldn't have minded just staying longer, but one of our extremely close friends had passed away while we were gone. Long-suffering illness, the timing of his death sucked ass, but it wasn't unexpected, and we were determined to make it to the service. So it seems our flight still hasn't been cancelled by the day of, so we go to the airport. If you've ever been to a tropical island, you'll know the airports are basically huts. You give someone your ticket in a disorganised fashion, and then run out into the parking lot where you hopefully find the right plane, go up the stairs and enjoy your trip. Due to the hurricane, tons of Americans were getting stranded and the hut was basically almost in a state of riot. When we finally got out onto the tarmac, the planes were not close to the door or in order, so you sort of haphazardly had to run and find your plane and hope you didn't have to cut a bitch for stealing your seat. It was a little crazy. Anyway, we finally get on our seats. We're on our way back basically flying through the pre-hurricane storms, which equals massive turbulence. I'm feeling a little queasy. I don't ever get air car boat sick, but there's a first time for everything. Despite the stewardess yelling at me, I spent maybe an hour in the bathroom waiting to throw up and alternating with diarrhea. Finally, it's time to land, so I have to go back to my seat. I don't mind throwing up in a bath bag, but fuck. I didn't want to do it with 40 people trapped next to me within smell, sight, earshot. It was the longest fucking landing of my life. Seriously, it took at least 45 minutes because of the storms. Holy fuck, as soon as we landed, it was another 20 minutes of taxiing. The entirety of my self-control was used for my GI track. All resources diverted. Finally, we get to the gate. I wait for everyone to get off first because I know if I move, I'll bath. I finally get up. My boyfriend is nice enough to take my backpack for me and, of course, I take my bath bag with me. As soon as we step off the plane and into the hallway, I start hacking and shitting myself at the same time. Luckily, all the bath made it into the bag, but, you know, not gonna be good still. Anyway, I eventually make it to the bathroom to clean up where I find out I have bath on my forehead. Turns out it was just gas, so hands are good. Continue on. Now we have to go through customs and make a connecting flight from Miami to my hometown. We get to customs and I try to get in line, but I have to shit. So I spend another 20 minutes in the bathroom pissing poop. My boyfriend has been standing in line and I try not to care about all the people glaring at me for cutting in front of them. We make it to the counter and the stomach cramps are otherworldly. I use all of my physical and mental power to stand up straight, try not to sweat too much and look pleasant so the guy will check us in quickly. We get through. Now, we have to get to the bags. I am feeling sick again. Time to find a bathroom. Spend another 20 minutes diarrheaing, and think it's safe to leave. As I'm walking out, I realize I'm about to puke all over everyone in front of me, so I run back, don't have time to lock the stall door and end up standing on one foot, one foot behind me on the door, hands on the side of the stall, distance puking into the toilet. Made it though. Boyfriend is wishing I would hurry up at this point and texting me. Though concerned, we are going to miss our flight. We rush through the bag check. He's essentially making me run through the airport at this point. We're running late. I want to die. I am in so much physical pain. Somehow someone takes our bags early and we get through security early ahead of everyone. I guess because our flight was soon. But now we are still many, many gates away from our target gate. We take a little airport train. 
I think about not throwing up on people. We walk to our gate and I'm feeling nauseous. We get there and the plane is boarded and waiting on us, but I started throwing up in a trash can and really shitting myself. I tell them to hold the plane for me while I go clean myself up, and my boyfriend and his brother are awesome enough to get that job done. They're Italian. They have a way of possessing a commanding presence when need be. The brother's wife is awesome and bringing me wet naps and medicine. Even though the medicine is not helpful at this time, it is a nice gesture and I appreciate it. I take some Pepto to seem grateful. I throw away my underwear, pants made it okay, clean myself up, and we get on the plane. I spend most of the plane ride in the bathroom, threw up the Pepto as soon as we took off. Most of the people around me seem to wonder why I go to the bathroom so often, but they are hopefully also grateful that I didn't throw up in front of them. We finally land and I throw up again while walking into the airport. At this point, I am a goddamn professional at walking and puking, so it's not even an issue. Pros. My boyfriend and his family are fucking awesome. He was constantly finding me plastic bags to bath in so we could keep moving, and though it sucked at the time, he did manage to get us home. I love him for that. He also sat next to me while I smelled like shit and puke. Also, hopefully I will never be able to top this story and every experience from here on out will seem magical. Cons, fucking awful. My wife works as an air hostess, and this story was relayed to me from her after one of her more eventful flights. As many of you probably know, Turbulence is an ordinary part of the flying experience, and air hosts are trained to know that it is not dangerous in most cases. A woman boards the plane with my wife. She could already tell that this lady was irritable, or at the very least, not comfortable flying. It was only a four hour flight and my wife makes a mental note to try and be extra nice to her when interacting. The moment that the flight takes off, the woman is hammering at the little button on the airplane, trying to get the air hostess's attention. So, my wife, once the plane is in a safe position in the sky, goes over and starts speaking to her. The woman has really red eyes, and my wife instantly thinks that she's taken some kind of substance, but is unsure what. She starts looking up at my wife, stroking her arm gently, and saying, Dearie, you need to get me off this thing, I think I'm gonna lose my mind. And then, without provocation, does she start shaking in her seat her arms and legs flailing, smacking the seat in front, and shouting very loudly. This upsets numerous passengers, especially those next to her, and she carries on going with her fit. After a few minutes of my wife trying to calm her down, offering her water and such, does she finally stop, and my wife has to move her to first class to get her away from the other passengers. She sits there, and does the same thing. At least this time, there was no one around to be bothered, at least not directly next to her. My wife is then tasked by the head stewardess to look after her for the entirety of the flight, because she was being so chaotic. This went on every few minutes. My wife says it was horrifying to watch. She wanted to call an ambulance when they were arriving, but the woman said that it was normal for her to have episodes on flights, as she is so, so afraid of the sky. Well, it was an interesting experience to say the least. Not me, but my mom's. My mom had given birth to my older sister a few weeks before this flight. She was going from Punta Arenas to Santiago, Chile. 
thing is, Punta Arenas is located at the southernmost border of continental Chile and is only accessible by plane or car through Argentina since it's separated from the country by miles and miles of ice fields. During the flight, the plane entered an air pocket and began falling. According to her, all of the trays went up to the ceiling and the oxygen masks were released. The plane fell for what felt like a minute before stabilizing. They managed to land at the closest airport they could reach, and the airline offered to pay everyone a night's stay at a hotel so they could board another flight. The plane that had malfunctioned was going to continue its trip to its destination. My mom went to the pilot and told them, I can't stay here by myself. I have a newborn baby with me and no diapers, no milk, no money, and no family in this city. Can't I just continue my trip on this plane? There was apparently no risk of anything happening if the plane stayed below a certain altitude, so she boarded the plane and kept on flying. Nothing major happened during the flight, but I can't even begin to imagine how ridiculous my mom was in that situation. I'd never board a plane again in my life, and there she was, boarding the same plane she almost died in, like an hour after it happened. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's stories. Of course, a huge thank you to Lady McCreepster for lending her amazing voice to these narrations in tonight's episode. It really was appreciated. Now, Lady McCreepster, as you heard at the start, is also a very talented narrator and has a channel of her very own. If you'd like to check out more of her work, please do click the link in the description or press the link on screen now. One will make you subscribe and the other will take you to her video. I really do recommend her. She is honestly so good. But anyway, for now, guys, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, check out Lady McCreepster, and I'll see you in the next one.